Well, good morning. Um, I'm Scott Che. I'm the host for Peter uh, Rich. And um, today is Peter's third seminar. And this seminar has a, uh, I guess, focus for the general public. And he's going to talk on what we can do to deal with climate change. And we've been keeping Peter obviously really busy for the past week and a bit. I'm really happy that uh, my dean, Dr. Stan Blade, is attending and he's happily uh, accepted my invitation to introduce the speaker. So I'm going to pass this over to uh, Dean Stan Blade. Thank you very much, Scott. I very much appreciate it. Good morning, everyone here and to everyone online. You're very welcome uh, to join this meeting. Um, my name is Stan Blade, Dean of the Faculty. I very much appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'm just going to take 20 seconds to say welcome. If you're here participating in University of Alberta Days, our alumni weekend, I'm not usually this branded, but check out the tie. There's a little green and gold action uh, happening here. Uh, this has been a fun 18 hours uh, as part of U of A days, we have also uh, had the good fortune of having the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who gave a lecture last night uh, as part of our Human Rights Lecture Series. Uh, so to have Dr. Rich here as well is just a, a remarkable thing. He asked me to introduce him as a, a special friend from the South. I think just to give him a little bit of uh, uh, recognition and to honor all that he has done, I'll just give you just a very short uh, bio, uh, just to note that he is the director of the Institute for Global Change Biology at the University of Michigan. And somehow, simultaneously, he maintains three uh, uh, separate chairs at the University of Minnesota. He's been very active, of course, in publication, uh, rank number one uh, for his publication record, an H index of 193. So for students in the room, this is something to aspire to uh, over the course of your career. And my personal favorite, we had a little chat, we had a social event for our faculty earlier this week. I'm just gonna read his last sentence of his bio if you have not seen it already. He has, however, failed so far to slow or stop either climate change or biodiversity loss. So his work has just begun. Please help me to introduce, uh, to, to bring Peter to the, to the podium. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for that very nice introduction. And um, I want to thank Scott and everyone else who's hosted me. It's been fantastic to be here. In fact, uh, if you look at the left of the two slides, pictures in the slide, that was from yesterday where with Charles and Brad Pino and others, I got a tour of some of the silviculture research a couple hours north. So it's, it's been a, a whirlwind tour, but, but really excellent. So I'm going to go. On Zoom, you got to find a different place to advance your slides. Um, I'm going to talk about the promise and pitfalls of relying on nature as part of our climate change solution. And so this is a really telling diagram that I'll use throughout my talk, that as we uh, burn fossil fuels and deforest, especially in the tropics, we release CO2. No one in this room is unaware of that. But of that 100% of those emissions every year that go in the air, only 45% of them stay in the air to the next year, and that the oceans and terrestrial ecosystems scrub more than half of that CO2 out of the air every single year. And this is uh, pretty amazing, I think. Um, so the Earth, even despite that, the Earth has warmed by one degree since 1900. But without those oceanic and land sinks, the Earth would have already warmed by two to two and a half degrees Celsius. So we would be in literally hot water even more than we are now without uh, nature helping us, without us even trying to help it along itself. Now, on the left of the two, uh, the left side of the slide, you can see a map of the world with all sorts of little icons everywhere. Don't worry about what they mean, but the, each of them shows a place on Earth where already we're suffering wildfires, drought, loss of crop production, infrastructure problems, flooding, um, pretty much everywhere on earth uh, has these problems and this impacts nature and, and humans everywhere. But if you don't care about that and all you care about is the bottom line, by 2070, every year, reductions from climate change in global GDP will be as bad as the worst years on record from things like the Great Depression and World War II every single year. Now you might think, oh, Peter's just like an environmentalist up there. This is not my data, this is from Swiss Re, 
the largest reinsurance company in the world who insure all the insurance companies. So if anyone with lots of money needs to worry about what climate change is doing, it's insurance companies and even more so the reinsurance companies. And so they've done careful analysis because they'll be bankrupt if they don't do this right. Um, and that's their uh, analysis of what climate change is going to do to the global economy. So this is a quadrillion dollar service that nature is playing for us already. Uh, will it persist and can we enhance it? I think I talked the other day more maybe about whether it will persist. And today I'm going to talk about whether we as humans can help enhance this. And these go by the name of nature-based solutions or climate nature climate solutions. And I'm going to really do three things today. Talk briefly about the premise and promise of nature-based solutions. Talk about some of the pitfalls, potholes, and practicalities or impracticalities. And then really ask whether any of it is plausibly has plausible potential. Here's a, a, a definition from Seddon at all, uh, uh, Seddon, excuse me, in a paper last year. She defined nature-based solutions as actions that involve working with nature as part of nature to address societal challenges such as climate change, and at best also providing co-benefits for both human well-being and biodiversity. And I'll kind of use that definition myself today. So getting back to this diagram, um, I've added another box there, which is enhanced sinks. So currently only 45% of the carbon we put in the air every year stays there. What if we somehow enhance those sinks in the oceans or land? You know, what if we take another 10% out of, of the atmosphere? Atmosphere increase would only be 35% of our emissions. What if we make a 30% increase such that the atmosphere only goes up 15% of what it would otherwise do? Those are ways we can kind of take a bite out of climate change. And the reason this might work is that there, as well, some of you probably know, but not all, there's three to four times as much carbon in soils and plants as there is in the atmosphere. And this is actually a very dynamic system. Every year, one of every seven molecules of CO2 in the atmosphere enters a plant through photosynthesis on land. And about one of every 10 goes into the ocean. So this is not like a very static system. It's very dynamic because, you know, we heard a lot about uh, the uh, climate rivers this last few years in terms of the move movement of weather stations, weather systems across the globe. Well, I think of this as a, as a river of carbon dioxide moving back and forth between the land and the oceans and the atmosphere. Here's a really complicated slide that I'm not going to walk you through at all just to show you that people have looked at in detail at all exhaustively at all the pools at fluxes. And I'm going to use a much simpler version here, which is still a little bit complicated to look at the global carbon cycle and the way in which these existing sinks work. So um, every year, the annual movement to the atmosphere of carbon in petagrams carbon um, is a 10 from fossil fuel burning, one from land use deforestation, uh, 120 from respiration, metabolism of plants and microbes, largely soil microbes, back to the atmosphere, and 78 from uh, the ocean. And this is five petagrams larger than the movement of carbon to, to the Earth's surface through photosynthesis on land of 123 petagrams and 81 being uh, absorbed by the oceans. So you see that the, the net change in the atmosphere of five is actually pretty small compared to the very large flows between the oceans and the land and the atmosphere. And in fact, um, this annual flow of carbon to plants by a land photosynthesis is 12 times the annual fossil fuel emissions. So every year while we're burning uh, fossil fuel around the planet and CO2 is going into the air, at the same exact time, 12 times as much CO2 is coming from the atmosphere into plants. Um, but also at the same time, about 12 times as much an, as annual fossil fuel emissions is going back to the atmosphere through respiration of uh, from plants and soil microbes. So very dynamic system. So the question is, what would it take to further cut climate, let's say by 40%? Well, this net change of the atmosphere would need to be three instead of five, because you're taking two fifths away, that's 40%. Well. That would require an increase in carbon acquisition by land of only 
So instead of 123 petagrams of photosynthesis on the planet, you need 124. And you need a decrease in carbon losses from 120 to 119. Now, those are small percentages. Um, and actually, they're orders of magnitude beyond what we can actually measure. Even these numbers of 124 or 123 petagrams movement from the uh, atmosphere to Earth and, and vice versa have huge error bounds. We actually don't know if the number is, is 100 or 150 because this is really hard to measure. Uh, 123 is our best estimate. And so we're trying to think about making a very minor shift in something that we can't measure very well. And what happens to the climate is a function of how much we keep carbon on the planet and how much we scrub out of the air. And this is a very small change compared to what's already happening naturally. And here, I'm going to give two slides that are simplified view of forest and grassland carbon sequestration. Well, in an ultra simple view of forests, you really can think if there's more wood in the landscape, there's more carbon because tree stems are by uh, mass 50% carbon. And so just a picture of uh, diversity plantings in Minnesota. And obviously as trees grow, especially on what was a previously bare site, there's more carbon. Um, of course, it's more complicated than that, but that's kind of the big picture for, because most of carbon storage in forests is above ground in tree stems or in recently fallen tree stems. In contrast, here's a really complicated view of grassland soil sequestration from a paper by Bayan Cotrufo in Science. Um, and I'll just walk us through it a little bit uh, where uh, plant diversity shown in the top there leads to inputs into soil of both dead plants and carbon that's transferred to microbes and carbon that's leaked into the soil. Then bacteria and uh, fungi work that material over and compete with each other for it. And themselves grow and they die and and the dead plant and dead microbial material then some of it is respired by other decomposers and the co2 goes back to the atmosphere but some becomes in forms that stick around for a while five years 10 years 200 years depending on the nature and uh, physical structure and chemistry of it and so the way in which soil carbon develops is immensely complicated um and actually, if you look at the numbers from uh, five and six, we see climate change also influences it as the things such as grazing and fire and other management. So there's no simple way to think, oh, if we do X in the landscape, it's going to mean Y for soil carbon. But there is an amazing amount of soil carbon in grassland, so it's important to maintain that and enhance it. And the way that carbon uh, is stored and processed in soils and forests is also similar. And so when we think of forest carbon in soil, it also is influenced by this very complex set of processes. And our ability to quantify this either for grasslands or soils is actually pretty primitive at any scale, but especially at the global scale. So are there any silver bullets that are like just help us solve climate change or have land be an important part of solving clim climate change, as well as reducing emissions and using renewable energy like wind and solar, which maybe is anathema to say in, in some uh, buildings in, in Alberta, but hopefully not this one. Um, so this is a very well-known figure from Griscom et al. 2017 paper with many, many co-authors, which they lay out about 25 different strategies or paths through which we could store more carbon in forests or, or grasslands or agriculture or wetlands. Um, and the bottom right there, you see the different colors. Many of those have co-benefits. So many things we do that actually lead to, and not, not all, but many things we do that lead to more carbon in the landscape might have benefits for biodiversity or environmental quality or people in other ways. And so um, this is a complicated uh, diagram. I'm not gonna walk us through it directly. I'm going to do it in a pictorial way where some of the ways in which you can get positive uh, carbon storage and sequestration are shown here. In forests, you can have re restoration in temperate or tropical forests where you take forests that pre previously were forests, are not being used for agriculture or anything else at the moment, but it's just kind of degraded sitting out there in the landscape and uh, enhance carbon storage on them. And this is from Project Drawdown. And we don't show boreal forests because most boreal forests uh, of the world actually still are intact forests. 
So there's less uh, room or a, there's less potential to restore boreal forests. It doesn't mean we can use not get more carbon in them other ways. So uh, forest restoration is one way we can do this. You can also avoid conversion of existing forests. Um, and in this case, we need to uh, additionally avoid. So we already have avoided conversions, but can we do management of our landscape so that in the future there's less conversion of, of forest uh, to other uh, kinds of land uses with, with release of CO2 to the air than there would be otherwise. So basically preserving, holding on to forests in one way or other, changing age structure, many, many other things, reducing fire, reducing insects and disease. There are other also more really direct on the ground management ways, tree intercropping, adding tree plantations, especially on degraded land and especially doing it in a way that's that's sensitive to local uh, peoples and using biodiversity to do it. Bamboo production, multi-strata agroforestry. When you get down in the weeds of all the different possibilities, there's literally dozens. Um, you know, switch to grasslands here. Uh, just like with forests, we protect existing grasslands, which have lots of carbon in the soil and avoid reduce the amount of those that are being converted to other uses that will uh, give us avoided uh, emissions. Uh, managed grazing can also add carbon to the soil. Conservation agriculture can not only add um, carbon to the soil, but much more important is that we can use much, much less uh, energy in our agriculture uh, without really taking very much of a hit in terms of productivity and actually in many cases, that would save money. I live, uh, I've lived much of my life in the upper Midwest. It's been known for 30 years that farmers add more nitrogen to their cornfields um, than they need to. And the ag economists have proven over and over again that if they backed off by 10 or 20 or 30%, their economic gains would be virtually identical, if not higher. But because it's so culturally embedded that they want the maximum yield, it's not done very often. So a lot of our issues are cultural, not uh, informational at all. Abandoned farmland restoration, just like forest restoration, taking abandoned farmland and converting it back into agriculture in ways that uh, are win-win for, for people and the forest carbon soil. Um, now I'm gonna go to this other figure that collapses all of the things I've shown in the last 10 slides or so into just three panels uh, this is from a paper by Girardin et al. in Nature um, a couple of years ago. And they used CO2 equivalents, where I've been talking about just CO2. So I've put both values here numerically. But their bottom line is basically by avoiding emissions that would otherwise occur or enhancing sinks, uh, we can uh, sequester enough additional carbon to offset maybe half of the annual increase in atmospheric carbon. This is through protecting forest grasslands, wetlands, and others, and intact lands, managing working lands so that there's more uh, carbon maintained on average in those soils and vegetation, and by enhancing and restoring native cover where it uh, has been degraded or disappeared entirely. And most of these are done in a way that think about only the lands that aren't already uh, allocated to uh, active agriculture or urban areas. And I also think of other uh, potential strategies that I think of as nature-based solutions that often are not considered nature-based solutions. Buildings that are made from trees or grass or bamboo can, some estimates they can offset as much as half a pentagram carbon per year. Um, Plant-rich diets and reducing food waste have enormous uh, potential. They could offset as much as two pentagrams of carbon per year, each of them. Um, and then carbon capture and storage in geological reservoirs could offset two petagrams of carbon per year. Now, it's not biology, but I think of geology as part of nature. Um, we already store all sorts of materials in geological reservoirs. Is it 100% safe? No, but, but uh, letting the planet roast is also not safe. And so we need to make choices among, among, among multiple things that are risky, which is the least risky and is the most benefit. So just these kinds of uh, what I think of as nature-based solutions alone also could wipe out much or all of climate change if somehow they're implemented. And of course, implementing these things is really where it gets problematic. And that's where I'm getting to in the next slide. 
you know, you can ask, but wait, do any of these nature-based solutions actually work? You know, people talk a good game about them, but is there any evidence that they actually work? Are they socially unjust? You know, are they helping rich corporations and not local people? Is there not enough land and not enough storage capacity to actually put more carbon on the land? What about competition between nature-based solutions and other land uses? Will it harm biodiversity? You know, maybe someone wants to plant uh, a really rapidly growing grassland exotic species that stores carbon, but you have no local biodiversity. A big one is like, well, isn't this all going to be too expensive? Then what about the barriers? And those could be social, cultural, political, economic to implementation. And then last, well, we've waited so long. Have we lost so much biodiversity and changed climate so much that it would wipe out all the gains from all of these? I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to spend a couple minutes on uh, several of them in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. So the first is, does nature-based solutions work in a technical sense? If you actually do this on the land, would it reduce emissions and or store carbon? And the answer here is a resounding yes, because there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of studies showing it. And to begin with, nature has already proven it. It removes 30% of the extra CO2 we put in the air without us even trying to help it at all. Um, we know from all sorts of experiments and observations in grasslands, forests, and agriculture that promoting biodiversity not only enhances productivity and stability, but it enhances carbon uh, sequestration uh, in plants and soils. Reducing fires, this is a no-brainer. Um, anytime a, a fire occurs, CO2 goes directly into the atmosphere. So reducing fires is going to leave more plant carbon in forests and more soil carbon in grasslands. Reducing deforestation also you know, isn't rocket science because trees are half carbon. Anytime a tropical forest is cut down to convert it into agriculture, all that carbon or 99% of it goes back into the air within a couple of years. And in the opposite of deforestation, we can restore grassland savannas and forests. And to me, I lump in restoring not just taking a piece of abandoned agricultural land in, in Minnesota or India or anywhere else in the world and re restoring it, but think about degraded systems. Um, and in much of the world, and in a place like Alberta is a little different given the the relatively newness of European settlement here and and the only a century or two centuries of active uh, use of the land. But in other parts of the world, um, many, many ecosystems are really degraded and could uh, have greater diversity and greater biomass and carbon in them. Uh, low input agriculture, as I mentioned before, low input agriculture, uh, we know actually how to do it. And it, it actually can save farmers money also, and it low reduces inputs of water, fertilizer, and carbon. And so even ignoring whether you're storing more carbon in the soil, in agriculture, it's much more important to just reduce the emissions. Grazing, uh, although as I showed a minute ago, uh, you can't just uniformly say grazing is always going to be useful, but grazing can be useful if done in the right way, in the right context, with the right um, uh, protocols. Uh, and things like urban trees, it's known that they reduce emissions, they store some carbon, but much more important is the amount of need for air conditioning and the extreme uh, emissions associated with that, that urban trees reduce. And so lots of different ways of doing it. And I think that's the big problem with, it's like we can't just have a the United Nations say, oh, everyone tomorrow is going to plant a tree, you know, and that's going to solve our climate crisis is, is there's a dozen or two dozen ways we need to do it. And we need to do it in everyone's backyard, areas the size of this, aggregated to the whole world. So that's the challenge is like what we do locally matters because what happens at the globe is really just the aggregation of all of this local scale impacts. So another one of the questions that people often say is, is it socially unjust that the way in which we're going to um, do nature-based solutions. And up at the top, I am uh, just put the title of a paper that talks about competing narratives uh, about leveraging the power of nature or dangerous distraction. And this is a big one because basically they're asking, if we focus so much on nature-based solutions, are we ignoring the bigger and real problems which involve uh, energy use, 
you know, that's more important to like keep fossil fuels in the ground than to, to let them burn and then try to like store them in, in soils. And, and this to me is very similar to the way I look at climate adaptation, where um, I think of climate adaptation when it's not done jointly with mitigation as being a very dangerous distraction because we're never going to be able to adapt to climate change if we don't stop it. Um, and of course, we need to try to adapt, but spending a lot of, uh, because we can better adapt locally than we can mitigate, because our mitigation requires a global action, I think we're spending a lot of time in universities and in NGOs thinking about adaptation much more than mitigation. And to me, that's a distraction. But the same uh, thing holds for some people in terms of thinking about nature-based solutions. And then there's also the issues in terms of uh, for people who are less powerful in many parts of the world. And the paper here from the journal Facets talks about the fact that things like protected areas and forest plantations can negatively impact indigenous peoples globally through displacement, livelihood restrictions, and ensuing cultural impacts. And there's a lot of concern about dozens or hundreds or thousands of nature-based solutions that have been proposed in terms of impacts on local peoples, not just indigenous peoples, but local peoples of all kinds. So those are, both of these are, are excellent uh, considerations, but it's not necessarily the case that nature-based solutions have to be socially unjust. Um, there's a paper in climate, Nature Climate Change recently that showed that demand side solutions to climate change, mitig um, to climate change mitigation are actually consistent with high levels of well-being. Um, this is less about um, nature-based solutions per se, but it did show that there are ways in which you can engineer this that actually are also um, consistent with high levels of well-being for people who are generally at the bottom of the power and well-being hierarchy of the globe. And another example, and these are both within country examples, is that enhancing urban tree canopies have greater cooling effects on socially vulnerable communities in the US. That's because they currently live in places that are much less tree covered. And so if we actually put in place more of these, uh, this as a solution, the people who will benefit um, would be the people who currently don't have any trees in their neighborhood. And so it's not necessarily the case that, that nature-based solutions have to uh, work against uh, justice. And instead of the within country, you can think among countries, because of course, some countries are richer than others. This is from a paper I was part of actually led by Akira Mori, which we looked at the relationship between biodiversity and uh, uh, carbon sequestration. It was done with models, so you know there's lots of uh, uncertainty. But the take home message here is that, that the countries that are most vulnerable, which are the poorest countries, are also the ones that will benefit the most economically from maintaining biodiversity and mitigating climate change and doing those together because they're the countries that their um, mitigation potential is higher. And so those are the countries which will suffer the most if we allow climate change to continue and allow biodiversity to be lost. But they're also the ones that would gain the most if we actually uh, simultaneously uh, mitigate climate change and maintain biodiversity. So in this case, acting to use nature to slow down climate change would actually be very socially just because we would alleviate, you know, that that uh, impact on global GDP, which may be seven or eight percent 50 years from now globally. Well, it's going to be 25 or 30 percent in many of the poor countries of the world and four percent in a place like Canada. You know, so everyone's going to take a hit, but the countries that are poor and have the greatest fraction of the world's poor people and people with uh, uh, less. Uh, uh, agency are the ones who would suffer the most if we don't fix this. How about not enough storage capacity? You know, we talk about planting trees, you know, does that, can we do that? Well, there's actually been four papers in the last couple of years that all tried to calculate, mostly from remote sensing, what they called unused potential. Or basically, if you look at a given kind of vegetation uh, that had very little human footprint on it, and compared it to, to something that did, what was the difference between them? So it's not like you're gonna let every forest and every grassland be old growth, but you basically take a region that has a distribution of, of, of uh, stand ages, let's say, but is relatively undisturbed by human act versus one that's lay, had much active forestry or agriculture. And all of them came up with very large numbers of, of basically potential that could be deployed in vegetation, whether forests or grasslands, um, 
you know, the numbers were from 150 all the way up to 500 petagrams. And that those numbers may not mean anything to you. So at the bottom, I put this note, 50 grams extra storage, which is less than, far less than any of these potentials, would equal 25% of the expected increase in atmospheric carbon for like the next 40 years. So, you know, even doing a small, making use of a small fraction of this would have a meaningful impact on climate change moving forward. Now, a paper I've been involved in recently that's actually in press at Nature used a, a very large global uh, database called the Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative, where collaborators from 200 countries, I mean, 270 uh, countries, but more than 200 collaborators with, with 64 million trees around uh, more than a million forest plots, put that data together. And we use this to see whether those remote sensing based estimates of, of potential carbon storage uh, held water, so to speak. Um, and basically we then combined it with the global, uh, with all the remote sensing database estimates from those various models. And the numbers we came up with was that there is actually 200 to 250 petagrams of unused potential in forests. And again, but well, unused means that, you know, that landscape as a whole, if managed differently, could actually have more carbon in it, even if you still have fire on the landscape and you have harvesting, but you just have maybe different uh, patterns or different amounts of it. And this is again, outside of cities and existing uh, grow crop and, and active pasturing lands. And this number of 200 to 250 pedigrams is consistent when back to the Griscom at all, list of all the different ways you could uh, store carbon. It's consistent with about 60 to 75 years of their estimate of around three and a third petagrams carbon. So I'm not saying we're going to do all of that. But if we managed half of that, it would reduce climate change by a third. If we did a six, a fourth of it, it would reduce climate change by a sixth. You know, so we can take, again, a meaningful bite out of climate change. We, we're not going to get it all the way there with any of these, and we probably wouldn't want to, but we certainly have the capacity to do a little bit. Remember, you only have to reduce carbon going back to the atmosphere by 1% or increase the amount coming in by 1% to land to have a, a big impact on climate change. And in this analysis we did, you know, we showed that although half of it is in above ground biomass, um, there's also about a sixth each in, in recently dead wood and litter in root biomass and in soil carbon in forest. Um, and that analyzed in different countries of the world is about 10 that make up about half of the capacity with the Brazil, US and Russia being high and Canada being lower, again, in part because more of the forests are in intact shape in Canada proportionally than many of these other countries, despite the huge amount of, of uh, forest land in Canada. But won't it cost too much? You know, all these things we talk about, precision agriculture, restoring forests, restoring grasslands, cost money. And that's true. So one estimated uh, estimate of the cost to stop climate change, not reverse it, but just stop it where it is today, is, and these, of course, estimates are have huge uncertainty, is $130 trillion in the next 50 years. Okay, But the same people who made that estimate um, said that the Avoided damages if we do that are 170 trillion, and then 300 to 400 trillion at least in the next 50 years. Um, so that even by 2070, while we're investing a lot to stop climate change, we'd be 40 trillion dollars ahead globally. So we actually save money. Now again, it's like, is it an ecologist like me making these numbers up? No, this is number from from Deloitte, a $65 billion annual company with 400,000 employees in 150 countries around the world. They do audit and assurance, consulting, financial advisory, and risk advisory to major corporations. So again, just like Swiss Re, this is a company whose entire business is based on understanding what's happening to the earth from a financial and economic standpoint. You know, it's not, it's not a, a tree hugger, um, someone who wants to make money on this. And their estimate is that we actually lose money, a lot of money, even in the next 50 years by not stopping climate change. And uh, there's cost with every kind. Of, you know, I'm talking today mostly about nature-based solutions. And of course, there's costs to building solar arrays and wind. But when you actually look at that against the avoided damages to agriculture and human health, um, et cetera, uh, the economics actually comes down well on the side of doing something now. 
Like one of the things that almost no model takes account of, but is in my mind this year is smoke. Everyone sees smoke a lot more from climate change induced fires. There was one analysis that saw that if you simply took the economic cost to healthcare around the world of, of declining human health, that that alone costs more than it would cost to stop climate change. The difference is that cost is distributed among every person on earth who breathes wildfire smoke, um, whereas the costs have to come from specific actions by specific agents, whether they're businesses or governments. So the scale of them are, is very different. And this leads me to barriers to implementation because there are dozens and dozens of them. This is from a paper or this year by uh, Adilos Casares and Ringel. Um, it's hard to read that, but what, what I want to point out is that they talked about the governance models being very important. And I'm just going to contrast the top and the bottom. You have hierarchical models where an agency such as the federal government of Canada, or the United States, or China decides to do some gigantic project like converting all of farmland to trees or, you know, making a giant reservoir or whatever it might be without much or any input from local peoples. And it's a very top-down model. The other extreme are community-led projects that might include things as local as community gardens, but it could also include like uh, First Nations-led uh, uh, management of areas of 20 hectares or 20,000 hectares or 200,000 hectares. And that these governance models uh, have impacts on things like social justice and biodiversity, but they also have impacts on whether or not the projects actually will succeed. They also, in this paper, summer, surveyed a, a number of players who work in nature-based solutions, um, a few academics, more people in government agencies and NGOs and business, um, and they asked them basically what the barriers were and whether specific uh, constraints on the left here were uh, not barriers or minor barriers or major barriers. Uh, and you can see that uh, that lack of financing options, insufficient successfully governance models, lack of evidence about nature-based solution viability, and lack of coherent policy to incentivize projects all had um, a good chunk of the responders thinking that they were pretty significant barriers. Um, and actually, even though even the viability of the solutions was a barrier, it was the one that was considered the least of a barrier. So these are huge barriers. How do you get money to implement that? Because like I said, we made as a society in Canada or US or globally be $40 trillion to the benefit from 2070, but getting a, an agency to do something today is very hard based on what happens over the next 40 years. Um, the governance models are also problematic because we have to be doing something that's has both short-term benefits for people as well as long-term benefits for the planet. I um, already talked about whether the nature-based solution is viable. And the last one is related to the first two really is that we have not much coherent policy to incentivize projects in very many uh, countries on earth. So these are our major constraints. And I'm just gonna show from going back to this paper by Seddon in, in uh, science, Natalie Seddon, she talks about projects that go wrong, but also ones that go right, and much can go wrong. And she just gives two examples here of one in Cambodia where 34,000 hectares uh, was uh, granted rights to convert that to acacia monocultures. Um, in, and this would have negative outcomes for biodiversity and actually climate mitigation and displace and marginalize local people. So this is instead of a win, 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 a lose, 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 lose done in the name of nature-based solutions, um, but in my jaundiced moments, you know, I think it's just someone trying to make, get rich from, from doing this. Um, and then there's other ones, like there's one she talked about in Uganda where the, uh, there's reforestation to offset carbon. They uh, reforested 25,000 hectares, but it relied on uncompensated disp disposition of peoples and violent eviction of those people. So it created a lot of local conflict and negative international publicity, and the project was abandoned after 10 years. So every one of the projects like these two, and there are a lot of them, give nature-based solutions a bad name and for good reason. But just because something, a good idea is done poorly doesn't mean it's not necessarily a good idea. Uh, and she talks about a couple projects, and this is an example of a couple, where not everything does always go wrong. This example she gives in, in Bolivia, where there's 
uh, Indigenous Council has given been given title to manage 390,000 hectares of ancestral lands, uh, and there's projected uh, avoided emissions and reduced slope erosion for this and habitat for biodiversity. Uh, and so this is a case where she considered, it, you know, this is potentially win-win-win. Another example is from Tanzania, where in a, uh, uh, a dry system using farmer-led pasturelands management with silver pastoral system could, in theory, enhance their livelihoods and store more carbon in the soil. Um, so we could do it wrong and we could do it right, and probably most projects will be somewhere in the middle. And she actually had this cartoon here, which summarizes all the things we've been talking about, that you've got the ideas of the various nature-based solutions that in theory bring benefits, not just for climate change mitigation, but climate change adaptation, biodiversity protection, enhanced well-being, you know, when when we're lucky with all these happen. Um, societal enablers is actually collapses like an immense uh, diversity of of social systems into this because you're talking about everyone from local people to city governments to provincial governments to global governments to to international consortia um and then of course you have the anthropogenic stressors where you might do this all very well maybe you have a fantastic restoration of forests someplace but then because of climate change it all burns down um all that co2 goes up in smoke carbon goes up in smoke you're back to square zero and so um, we have to get all these things right to make these work. So the take-home message is like, I'm not, my point isn't that storing more carbon on land is going to on alone by itself stop climate change. And in fact, I think we actually need to pay more attention to uh, reducing our fossil fuel emissions and figuring out how to reinvent how we do things so we use less fossil fuels. But nature-based solutions can help in a meaningful way uh, and also providing co-benefits to nature through biodiversity enhancement, for instance, or people, things like clean air, economic well-being, and the like. So I think we really need to stop arguing about whether it has potential. The real question is whether people, humanity, we who are so good at doing things not in our collective interest, will act in our own self-interest in this case. And I'm not confident we necessarily will. Uh, actually, I am confident we will, but I think things will have to get really bad before we do it, um, and then we will do it. And, and they already are really bad, but maybe even worse. Um, and it's because getting societies, whether they're whether it's just a bunch of faculty, or a local government, or a nation, or globe, uh, to act in their own self-interest collectively, is infinitely harder than knowing how to store more carbon or emit less less carbon on farms, forests, and cities. And so I think that's the real challenge. Is is how do we actually make this happen? Um, and it reminds me of this cartoon, which is from a couple of decades ago, but it's still to me very telling. You know, all the things we talk about with nature-based solutions, or the vast majority of them, um, are things that actually are good for people in nature anyway. Um, so there's this cartoon, you know, a couple of decades ago saying, What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? So um I think that's that's still a really telling statement because most of the things we'll do, and certainly if we don't stop climate change, it's going to have negative impacts on almost everything else. Um, so I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. And thanks for uh, coming and listening today. That was a really, the song? That was a really engaging talk. Didn't realize it was already 45 minutes past. Um, so we do have time for questions. Um, anyone would like to kick this off? These questions? I see one over here. And because we have uh, people online, so I would like you to use this microphone. Um, I've been to, this is the third talk of yours I've been to, and they've all been excellent. and. One of the things that I keep thinking about, and I think you've dropped some breadcrumbs in previous talks, is um, what what kind of role should humans take in assisting the migration of species as their range shifts in response to climate change? And how do we reconcile that with trying to preserve biodiversity and thinking about concerns with invasive and non-native species? That's a great question. Um, and I was talking to folks yesterday in the field about this issue. and. Um, 
because because of what ecologists and foresters have told governments in the past, there are like rules about what you can plant. And that's true in Canada and other places. Like some, in Minnesota, for instance, um, we're not allowed to plant certain things that are species that aren't local, you know, in certain kinds of uh, government sponsored activities. Um, and now we have to more quickly uh, engage with those who make those kind of decisions so that we have more flexibility. Because, for instance, um, like I'm not saying you should plant, you know, eucalypt in northern Alberta, um, but you could probably plant some uh, white spruce that's from several hundred kilometers south of of the current location and maybe have a better match for the future climate than if you plant a local uh, white spruce. And I don't think we're doing, from what I we talked to yesterday, Charles, that's not how things work here yet. Um, and I think that, so I think we need to use assisted migration, you know, within species or among species in a way, and I think this will actually maintain biodiversity in the long run, because if we don't do this, you know, people are worried that, oh, I love of uh, the spruce fir forest in northern Minnesota. Um, and if I don't try to preserve it, you know, if we plant something else there, that's going to reduce biodiversity. And you might lose the species you currently have there, but hopefully those will still be somewhere else and that you'll have a, a more diverse and more productive, more stable system going forward. So I think the climate's changing faster than, than obviously it did before. We can't just um, assume that doing nothing is the best way to preserve biodiversity on the site. I'm not sure I totally answered your question. But... The next question is coming from Stan Braith. Trying to fill the vacuum there for a moment, but I'll just uh, say, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I mean, you've made a compelling case for the urgency of nature-based solutions. I'll just raise it up one level. Our faculty works with a lot of groups and for people that watch broadcast television, which in this room probably would be very few people, uh, the dairy farmers of Canada have made multiple television commercials about that they will be net zero by 2050. 2050 seems to be this magical number. How do you engage with groups, with companies, with, with organizations that somehow lay out this magical uh, pathway to 2050? That's a fantastic question. And like for instance, the University of Michigan says it's gonna be uh, climate neutral by 2035. I think the devil is always in the details. Like what kind of accounting are you using to say what counts as, as part of that carbon accounting instead of economic accounting? Um, and so I think what we need to do is, first of all, applaud groups that are doing that and hope that they're doing it at least half because they really want to do the right thing and not just greenwashing. You know, there's, of course, elements of both often. But then, actually, and this is, I think we don't do very well in academia. We're in our, stuck in our ivory tower. We need to actually work with them to educate them about how they actually could do that. Because when I, I look at the plans at the University of Michigan or I've talked to Resolute Forest Products, the head of their sustainability, they have no plan for, for climate change. They don't think about climate change. It's just like mind boggling. Um, and so I think there's actually a lot of education because people who run big businesses, they know a lot about those businesses, but they don't under, know about climate change or carbon cycling or methane. And so I think the dairy farmers, if they told you what they were going to do. Maybe some of it doesn't hold water scientifically, but they may not know that. Um, and so I think we need to do a better job of getting outside of here. And I don't know how we do that because not all corporations or agencies are inviting us to come talk with them, but we need to go knock on their doors um, and not do it in a blame way. It's more like, you know, I mean, I flew here, you know, I, I'm as guilty as the next person for causing climate change. Um, but collectively, we need to think about how we do fly less, fly with more efficient uh, airplanes, all those kinds of things. And so I think it's really a case of, of trying to integrate people who actually understand climate change solutions, including the economics of them, into those companies. Um, and some companies, or the way in the same, you know, the same exact uh, business, some are like way ahead of others in doing that. And my hope is that those companies will actually be the ones that economically prosper and the others are going to go, you know, an oil company that isn't investing in, in wind and solar 
and hydrogen kinds of technologies, they're going to go bankrupt. Whereas the ones who pivot, you know, like the carriage companies in 1890 that didn't try to also make cars that were worked on fossil fuels went bankrupt. And so I think, um, I don't know how we do it, but I think we've done a terrible job in general at universities at figuring out a way to be more relevant to the rest of the world and help these solutions. And so that's something, that's one reason I took my joint position in Michigan is to try to get the university there to make climate change a priority, not just for people like me who think about forests and the environment, but for the business school and the law school and the nursing program, et cetera, et cetera, because I think actually climate change is relevant to all of those and needs to be a much more part of their conceptual framework for why they're doing what they do and what it will mean. But if you have any ideas of how to do this better. <laughs> so. All right. Sorry, Charles, uh, we'll come back to you. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm Jen Beverly, so wildfire uh, researcher. And um, just a couple of, uh, I guess, if you could help me understand some of the the challenges in, in a couple of your points. So one of them was this, this idea that local adaptation and efforts to do that is a distraction. And the focus really needs to be on the global grand mitigation schemes. And, and I know a lot of people have that position. Actually, actually I didn't. Hopefully I didn't give that. I meant that the local adaptation should also be about local action for mitigation that adds up globally. So okay. it's not that we need to think of trying to solve this globally, but that local adaptation that's done without also simultaneously thinking about mitigation to me collectively is a distraction because if we don't mitigate all the adaptation in the world is going to be for naught. Right. So. And, and I guess, and part of that is also in your kind of, more closing comments, just commenting on, you know, until it gets really bad, nobody's going to do anything or it's going to be hard to incite action. Mm -hmm. um, and as a wildfire researcher, I, I mean, I basically around, I would say seven, eight years ago, really shifted my thoughts to, I need to do what I can to deploy rapid solutions that, that can be implemented immediately to keep people safe next year. And uh, really changed my research focus to try to develop those, those kinds of tools, recognizing that the grand solutions uh, another study looking at what you know how much fire we're going to have in 50 years isn't helping any of the 200,000 people that were evacuated this summer. It didn't help. None of the studies that I've seen in the last 20 years on wildfire uh, really contributed anything to constraining the 17 million hectares of burned forest that we experienced across Canada this summer. So, you know, in in addressing these solutions, I guess, do you see a place for this shift to rapid deployment of innovative approaches, and that really means departing from the, the standard of, of traditional science that, that takes two years to publish and, and 10 years to implement. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think, although you seem to think that most of the effort is on global mitigation, I actually think that far more of the dollars that governments spend is on local adaptation, because that's, you know, the local council person is going to be much happier if you get some benefit for their local community. Um, and I, I think we need to do both. Um, but I think that neither the traditional science or what you do now is going to be as helpful as somehow translating those damages to people, for instance, from smoke um, or from flames themselves um, in a way that gets some kind of traction in the, in the way we manage our our resources and and uh, businesses, and so I think, um, yeah, I don't want you to think that I don't think things like that are useful, but I think that doing them in isolation from simultaneously thinking about how do we mitigate climate, I think is is just going to kick the can down the road, and the cans are going to get bigger and more explosive every time, and so um, it it's. It's a tough problem because we do need to to uh, try to save people today. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't have a, a great solution to that. But next one is coming from Charles. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Peter. I uh, was curious with the 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 slide with the mitigation boost, and then looking at the flat part of it, like whether you're you know worried about people kind of turning that back against you in, in terms of the argument or 
or does that fall back on you know the other benefits of of biodiversity? Which or, which uh, slide were you thinking? Uh, where you have the the mitigation boost and then sort of flat and then ramps up, yeah. right? So you could look at that flat part of the curve and then sort of say, well, there's no. Well, that, if I remember that particular slide, I think that the x-axis was the social cost of carbon, and so everywhere along that curve, people benefit from. It's the other part of it, which was the mitigation potential, how much. And so, yeah, so a rich country may not actually gain as much in mitigation potential. And it's uh, avoided negative economic consequences to be smaller, but they're still very large. And so. And actually, I can go back to uh, Jen. Is it Jen Beverly's question? One of the other things I grapple with a lot is that you could argue that people, and this is a completely uh, subjective value, we can value helping people today versus in the future. And that a lot of some people who object to, to nature-based solutions think, oh, there's all these people who are in harm's way today from droughts, wildfires, sea level rise, corrupt governments, wars, et cetera, and that any dollar spent trying to save the world for 50 years now is a dollar we're not spending now to help people today. And that actually is true. Um, but I, I would argue that the my personal opinion is that we also owe a lot to people who aren't born yet, and that those people, more of them are going to suffer and they're going to suffer in a more major way if we don't solve climate change um, than all the suffering that, that occurs today. And so that's a value. I, I, of course, wish we could help both. Um, but I think that we actually spend more attention and money trying to help people today. Even though the world is always in terrible shape, there are people with good data showing that a smaller fraction of the world's population is, is in abject poverty uh, and that that's gone down decade after decade, despite all the terrible things that have happened the last 50 or 60 years, in part because we're burning fossil fuel to bring people's standard of living and well-being up. Um, and so, but I think one of the things we need to think about is what are the, and actually I had a slide in there, but I took it out, that looks at that nature-based solutions sometimes actually favor future generations over uh, people who are more disadvantaged today, um, but not... Uh, fixing climate change does the reverse. And, and I think it's an unavoidable trade-off. I I don't have a solution to that, but I think it's actually part of the picture. And people who are alive today can shout louder than those who aren't alive today. And so I think that's one reason to me, I think they need a voice or many voices. Dr. Rich, um, with regard to forest fires, some of uh, observers have said that the fires are not due to climate change, but rather to poor forest management. Now, I don't know enough to, to know uh, if it's one or the other, but I'm wondering if you've had any thoughts with regard to sure, forest but management. I, actually, I'll ask Jen to answer that question first. She probably thinks about this a lot. I do too, but she probably knows more even. Thanks. I mean, I think uh, there's a bit of both, of course. So when you look at the the weather we had um, this past year, unprecedented conditions in terms of the uh, drought conditions uh, simultaneously across the whole country, um, ex you know, the extended uh, periods, weeks and weeks of, of really dry, hot, uh, windy weather that uh, led to really large fires um, that overwhelmed suppression resources. I mean, that was definitely a, a weather factor and um, there's no doubt that changes in global heating is resulting in larger fires more opportunities for those big fires so that's a big part of it in in some parts of the country uh, so the interior bc would be an example uh, those ecosystems have been impacted by forest management activities and suppression activities as well um, so replanting uh, the same conifer species um, over and over again, and and then also suppressing fires in places where 
you normally had fires coming in and cleaning out the vegetation leading to that fuel buildup problem. Um, but it, across a lot vast areas of the boreal where a lot of these fires are burning, uh, I haven't seen any concrete evidence of uh, forest management being responsible for changes in, in fuels. So it's, it's mixed. And I echo that and I have a, a further comment is a couple months ago, or maybe less than that, I was asked to comment for, I don't know, the New York Times, I can't remember, some publication about a report coming out from about 16 Canadian climate scientists that examined and tried to attribute this year's uh, fires in Canada, which I was amazed to see. It broke the prior record, this is by August, by three times the amount, you know, so it's not just like, you know, I don't know what the record is for goals in hockey, you know, but imagine someone getting three times as many goals next year, you know, it's like unthinkable. Um, and that this uh, set of Canadian scientists basically said that, and I, I like this, I actually don't like attribution science, and I'll explain why in a second, that rather than trying to say, oh, climate change caused these fires, they basically said the change in the Earth system is such that conditions are ripe for there to be more fires and larger fires. And it's basically pure biophysics that this is going to happen more and more often. Same with, with extreme rain events. It's like you have a more energy in those systems and that cause more intense rainfall and you have more conditions that create drying conditions regardless of forest management. And so the forest management may play a role here and there, but by and large, globally, it's unavoidable that as we warm up the planet and dry soils through excess evapotranspiration and dry the air through having a higher uh, drying power of the air, there's going to be conditions for more and more fires. And, and so that's, uh, I think, some for some people, it's convenient to point to forest management and poor forest management does play a role, but Forest management is not going to stop us from having more and more fires in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> All down. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's really very my uh, opening talk. Enjoyed. Okay, my question is: Well, you interpret unused potential. In my view, no one can do better than nature. So it doesn't matter what a human do, you know, it mess up the system. So nature is optimum. Anything we do is suboptimum. So I like to hear your thoughts, you know, how I, things we do can really help, you know, increase the potential. I think it depends on what your uh, scale or metric for, for this is. If like if nature is optimum, then we should have the most food and be able to hold, have the support the greatest human population without agriculture, right? Yeah. You basically, just hunt and gather. Um, and so, uh, agriculture, of course, causes all sorts of problems. But from the standpoint of human food production, it produces more than nature would have without. And so, I think the same thing. In I'm not saying that necessarily the most carbon rich grass in a forest is the one you would want for other purposes. But certainly you can engineer uh, forests and grasslands that hold more carbon than they do today on average. Um, and then the challenge is do it in a way that actually has other co-benefits rather than negative uh, consequences. Are there any successful examples about that? Oh, yeah. There's all sorts of successful examples. Um, in like, for instance, much of the Midwest United States, when uh, marginal agricultural land was abandoned, and in some places, it's allowed to go back to, to natural grasslands as those succeed, you know, through natural through secondary succession over 20, 40, 60, 80 years. They store more carbon. They are home for more biodiversity. People appreciate them in their environment. They're like, you know, so the value to human society, you can measure it in dollars because people's enjoyment of that is real. And so from the standpoint of, of well-being of people in the area for biodiversity and carbon storage, you had that example there. And I think there's probably many others uh, as well. Okay, another question. In my opinion, in my view, what do we do, the many things we do here, really not to solve the provide solution, but actually delay the, the problem to the future. For example, we use timber 
for, uh, for buildings. We hold the carbon for another one or uh, one uh, 200 years, but eventually those carbon has to go back to the air. Yes, so I think certain kinds of sequestration are more permanent than others. Um, you know, dumping logs at the bottom of the ocean, you know, some, you know, has a cost, but those they will stay around a long time, a lot longer than than if you put it in a landfill. Um, and I think everyone recognizes that you know you don't, so growing trees to produce uh, pulp uh, isn't a long term solution because it goes back to the atmosphere soon. If you make a really really beautiful piece of furniture, it's going to stick around fifty, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years. So I think part of and actually there's a paper. I just read in preparing for this talk that actually came up with a metric to use the, the time horizon to like make an integrated value for its value for society. Um, but I think the other thing is that we're thinking that 40, 50 years down the road, we will have figured out how to produce our energy and get transportation with using a lot less fossil fuels. And that at that point, we can bleed some of this back to the atmosphere. So I think part of it is also like, we're in emergency mode, you know, Let's try to hold on to carbon right now until we get our act together. Um, so. Thank you. Sure. Hey. Hi. Um, well, having all these models that have like a lot of uncertainty, how can we make sure that some of the ideas from nature-based solutions are having an impact for real and it is not part of this uncertainty? And also, what needs to be done? What else do we need to have like better models to calculate these dynamics of the carbon? So there's two parts of the question. One is like, does all the uncertainty actually make me worried that anything we do is is actually going to be useful? And the second part is, is it is reducing that uncertainty useful to make any difference? So the first part is yeah, for sure. Um, about 12, no, 14, 15 years ago, a Republican governor, that's how times change in Minnesota, actually had a plan for carbon neutrality for the state. Um, and they were going to allocate money for people to do things that would lead to carbon neutrality. And the forestry and agricultural sectors came up with all sorts of ideas, um, some of which like double counted the same land or, or triple counted the same activity in different categories in ways that like didn't uh, meet the standards of, you know, what I call, think of as good accounting. Um, and so, yeah, I think there are people, and there's actually, luckily I can't remember the name, a big company in Southern California that's trying to make billions of dollars by selling, you know, using soil microbes to store more carbon in ways that, to me, grossly exaggerate, you know, the reality of what they can do. And so I think, yeah, we need to worry about these things. We just need to do it, you know, better than we did in the past. Um, and the reason is is not so much reduce the uncertainty so we can do it better, that's part of it, but also as part of gradually changing the way society thinks about this issue. An example I give in, in maybe this is wishful thinking, but in 10, 12, 15 years ago, certain sector of the political spectrum in the US wanted to like make gay marriage constitutionally illegal in many, many states. They put this on the ballot and people were worried that, you know, this would become, it was neither legal or illegal, but they wanted to literally make it illegal forever. And maybe in their 20 or so years ago, when they did polls of the nation, 60 or 70% of people thought that was a good idea to make it illegal. And somehow society's views changed, flipped in like in five or six years. Um, and all of a sudden people thought differently and almost all of those uh, referendum failed. It didn't become, like in our state, it, it failed. And then actually a couple of years later, we had a referendum that made it constitutionally legal to have gay marriage. So we flipped it on its head. The point is that at the time, early in this story, people thought it would be like decades and decades before gay marriage was legal. And somehow society vision of the world changed fast. So what I'm hoping is sometime, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years, and maybe it's the next generation, that just like a 14-year-old kid might think very differently about 
um, a queer co-student than their parents or grandparents do, maybe they also think differently about what we're doing to the planet in terms of climate change. And that that becomes more part of the fabric of their value system. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but that's kind of part of how I think about it is that is that we can preach to the, to the choir and that doesn't seem to help, but maybe the choir gets bigger over time somehow. So, you say preach to the choir in Canada, you know what I mean, but okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Okay, LA. I'll get back a little bit to what Feng Lang was was talking about about these these areas with unutilized potential mm -hmm. and lots of ecosystems mm -hmm. we could manage mm -hmm. and change in a way that we could cram more carbon in, mm -hmm. but that's going to change them, right? And and you know you can imagine you know take an abandoned field and plant trees that, you know, you can see that as a positive thing, but I worry a little bit that it's, it's too easy to think we can just cram stuff in. We can just plant trees everywhere. We can take every unstocked forest and stock it up. And that's, that is going to fundamentally change the functioning of those ecosystems. It is going to change the biodiversity. And, you know, do you have thoughts on how we struggle with, that balance to to gain the benefit in terms of the carbon sequestration, but also recognize that we are changing other things. And what are we prepared to live with in terms of what we might lose? Sure. Um, and I, I totally agree with your statement that we can't just like plant trees everywhere and do those kinds of things. But actually, I think your last statement is reverse. If we do this in a thoughtful and, and practical way, it actually will enhance those values you talk about rather than de degrade them. And I'll give an example. So like, the bad example is like, I visited China nine years ago and my host showed me places where they literally planted hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of trees that all died, you know, and it's not the only place in the world that's happened, but you know, um, and they were not just for carbon sequestration for erosion control and other things. Um, so you can't just plant trees every but there are actually an amazing amount of lands which have been degraded by past human interactions or actions and influences that collectively don't house biodiversity that we value, don't store a lot of carbon, don't purify air or water very well. And maybe living in Alberta, you see a nature that's less disturbed. You know, you go randomly drop somewhere in the eastern north america whether it's in georgia or pennsylvania or connecticut and if you see the urban or rural recovering forest it's got invasive species there's not good regeneration you know st stocking is really low compared to what it could be and and in general and diversity is lower than it could be the, now cost money to try to figure out how do you manage that or I use the word restore for to me that's still restoring even though it's still a forest um and so I think figuring out ways to do better with those kinds of lands around the world actually would have multiple benefits so it's not like oh you're going to like take a native grassland someplace and plant trees it's more like all of those semi-degraded lands of the world of which there are astounding a number could in theory um, be home to more different species and species that use more of the resource and hold on to more of the resources. And I think that's, you know, we should go for the lowest hanging fruit to begin with. And certainly the lowest hanging fruit in some places, abandoned agriculture, which has no carbon virtually in it. Um, and so restoring those to prairies or if some places they're, they were in forested areas to forests makes a sense. But but just like willy nilly planting trees everywhere doesn't make any sense. So I think there's there and and the example I give also is like we only need to add carbon to like a fifth of or a tenth or a twenty a twentieth of what's possible to actually uh, help do a little better. And actually, I talked to Brad uh, yesterday when we were traveling, and um, Brad Pino and Charles who had to go to class. And actually an email exchange with Brad this morning, because I was asking him, like from a silvicultural standpoint, would it be possible to slightly change 
And I, I didn't ask him whether it was a good idea or economically feasible. Would it be possible to change the uh, age structure of all of Alberta's forests, the age distribution by changing rotation age just slightly, um, planting you know at relatively higher or medium densities of improved uh, provenances that grow faster um, and uh, do other things like that that would increase the average standing uh, biomass and carbon in forest in Alberta. And he said, yeah, I mean, those things. And so the question is, which of those do you do where and and why? So I, I think that we paint this as, this happens a lot in, in not just ecology, but a lot of areas where, because someone has an idea and then they, they pitch it all the way to the extreme, then the kind of an easy knee jerk reaction is to like reject all of it. When if they just present it in a more reasonable way, you know, it still has some elements of, of good in it. So, thanks. You have any other questions? Okay, there's another one back here. Another question. Um, thank you for the talk. That was great. Um, I, uh, you only touched on this briefly, but you mentioned that managed rangeland, managed grazing systems can be a carbon sink. And I just find that thought provoking because we hear so much about how, um, you know, the um, beef, the cattle industry is a huge uh, creator of carbon output and methane and whatnot. And how simply, I guess, can you talk more about how just changing management can um, actually not just reverse it, but create a carbon sink? Um, sure. There's yeah. kind of two parts to the question. The second one is a more challenging one. <laughs> the first one is that when we talk about, let's say, managed uh, grass, and they could be the same for managed forests because we take product off and there's carbon costs for moving those and carbon costs. Um, a lot of the thoughts about managing for climate resilience or for climate mitigation are comparing it to what happens now. We're already having negative consequences in many places of forestry operations, or oil and gas or, or grazing. And, um, and so if you actually move the needle and make it less bad, that actually helps in the aggregate sense because when you look at the whole globe. And so doing like, like the low input agriculture, if you grow corn with half the inputs, you're still adding CO2 to the atmosphere, but you're adding less than were added last year. Um, but I think the other part of that first part of your question is, is like full life cycle and kind of analyses is like, if you actually look at the, at the full life cycle of the, beef industry and don't just look at what happens to the soil carbon, but what is the full carbon costs and methane costs of climate change cost of that, you might come up with a more difficult justification for why that's good from a climate standpoint. Now, people might think it's good because people like to eat meat and people like to make money and people have, you know, all those other reasons. Um, and so turning like almost anything into carbon saving, like, not just net neutral, but like positive in the sense that you're actually storing more carbon than you're, you're using, that's more challenging. Um, and I'd say that's very, very hard to do because even solar and wind, there's carbon emissions associated with making those go. They're not like, they're not net neutral either. Um, and the only things that people have talked about are things like carbon capture and sequestration, which sometimes you can think about soil carbon as being one part of that, because if you do increase soil carbon in grasslands, it happens slowly and it sticks around for a long time. Um, but you can also think about things like scrubbing part of the CO2 off emission streams and putting it in geological reservoirs, or actually there are literally engineering techniques to scrub it right out of the air, but they're just too expensive currently to use, but maybe some really clever engineer will make them more economically viable in the future. I mean, to me, it's amazing. Maybe it shouldn't be that amazing. We can scrub anything out of the air, but it's just cost. Um, so I think that's the real challenge is figure out how do we 
make any one sector our, of our economy and our, our uh, culture be less damaging to the environment. Because we make everything less damaging to the environment, some of them are actually positive and some are negative, we're moving in the right direction. And so, um, and, and I think that the challenge is that also that we, it creates this great um, political uh, inability to have engage in useful political discourse when we demonize certain industries or people who like those industries demonize people who want those industries to be greener and that we don't do a very good job in society, you know, and this has actually gotten worse across the whole world, uh, our inability to talk across these political divides. And I think that's actually a big problem in terms of coming up with solutions. Uh, and I have absolutely no solution for, for that, um, other than hoping somehow it's part of a pendulum that will go back the other way. Okay, we still have time for questions, but uh, Stan has to go. Mm -hmm. So Stan would like to make a presentation to Peter. So we, I would like to allow him to do that before he leaves. This seems like the worst possible way to interrupt a great exchange, but just to uh, uh, offer just a small memento of your time here at the University of Alberta and within our faculty, uh, rumor has it that you may be doing a little bit of hiking in the next little while, uh, just a little device here that you may be able to rehydrate every once in a while, and there's a metal straw involved as well, so that's also important, but just thank you so much. Thank you. You're just great in all terms, but please let's keep the... Uh, the uh, the conversation's going. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Stan. So again, we still have more time if you have, if you're not uh, in a rush to go back to what you need to be doing. So any other questions for Peter? Felix? Um, the elephant in the room very often, and maybe you've already answered this in your very last answer, is um, political will. There are, of course, not just countries, but companies and so on that will win with global climate change and are positioned, whether, you know, increase in population, uh, that uh, <laughs> increase in agriculture because in northern countries uh, like Russia will possibly, in the minds of those who have power, be uh, winners. How do you convince them that actually they're the you know for the benefit of the planet it is uh, maybe not a good idea to uh, make wars and such? Sure, that's a great question. Um... Obviously, convincing people like you know Vladimir Putin to do anything that that's not evil is is a, a big challenge. Um, but I think the bigger premise of your question actually is easy to answer, or they may not know it, but climate change is going to be very bad for Russia, um, just like it's going to be very bad for Canada. It won't be as bad for Canada as it will be for the Maldives Islands, but it's going to be very bad. Um, and I think that when it's not people like me saying it, but it's the Swiss, you know, the major corporations like reinsurance companies and consulting companies who are advising major corporations say to them, your ability to grow canola is going to go down the tube in 40 years, or your ability to do X, or your, your maybe your ability to grow canola is fine, but your floods are going to, your infrastructure is all going to flood, your roads are going to be, whatever it might be, but that, the notion that like that places that are cold good, are going to do better with climate change is completely uh, has no basis any longer, given all the evidence we have about things like increasing fires and increasing floods um, and event-driven uh, kinds of things. And so, I have no idea whether the people in in the higher echelons of Russian government who know this. Um, but they should. And so it's, it's not really an issue that they are going to benefit because they won't benefit. Um, um, we still have quite a few people online. If you have any questions, you can maybe type your question in the chat box and I will pass it on to Peter. Um, Peter, I have a question for you. Um, 
so that uh, we give people in the audience maybe a bit more time to think about questions they want to ask. Um, I guess the question I have is the the carbon credit uh, concept or, or the practice where people can buy carbon credit so they can keep polluting. And I'm not too sure if you have heard of this before. Some people, uh, the analogy is that people can kill other people and then give the community some money <laughs> for that. So what is your take on that, the, the scheme of uh, buying carbon credits and trading carbon credits? Well, there's all sorts of, of policy devices people have thought up to help uh, us use less carbon, including carbon taxation and including carbon credit trading and the like. Um, I personally think that anything that helps us in this direction is fine. Um, and that um, the carbon credit example you give, like in, I know more about it in the US and it, it can sometimes have positive and maybe it has negative consequences that, or unintentional ones that I can't come to mind right now. But basically companies are more likely to make money if they use less energy because using less energy right away saves money. And then they can actually make more money by selling that credit to another company. So there's actually an incentive in there to use less energy. And um, I have a friend who's like is in one of these large international consulting companies who advises the sustainability offices of major corporations. And the corporations are so big that they, just like we complain about the government, that they waste lots of money simply because one branch of the company doesn't know what another is doing or doesn't understand the economic costs of things. And so um, in many cases, they use more fossil fuels simply because they don't have the personnel to figure out a way to use less. Not that they wouldn't do it, but they literally don't have the bandwidth to figure out how do we do something different. And so I think that anything that further incentivizes using less energy and forcing other people to pay more to use more energy um, would be good. Now, like I said before, the devil's in the details. You have to have the pricing right. You have to have it actually um, have the consequences you're looking for rather than just everyone using more energy. And so I think that's part of it too, is like you have to penalize people enough in essence for having to buy more credits and incentivize enough those who might want to sell their credits that they haven't used for it to be to work. Great. Um, another question I have is coming from your on your coming from your presentation, you mentioned that it's going to be really difficult to quantify changes in the carbon stock in different components of the ecosystem and so forth. So the question is, if we know that something's going to work. Does it really matter to quantify whether we quantify that carbon sequestration or not? Maybe the government should develop some policies where just like communities have bylaws that you have to do this and you cannot do this. Um, so, yeah, so in essence, you're saying if we know something is useful to do, but there's uncertainty about it, but we're pretty sure it's useful and that, you know, the uncertainty is all on the, on the useful side of the equation. Do we need to know more about it? Should we, shouldn't we just do it? And I think absolutely, and I think more emphasis should be placed on doing those kinds of things. But because there's always naysayers and skeptics um, and what you do could be refined and more targeted, we, we always need to understand more what's happening. So in the for agriculture, which of the 73 thing, ways of like storing more carbon or using less carbon in agriculture mm -hmm. actually are ones that are useful from a climate standpoint and actually are useful from from uh, soil health and or from a human nutrition standpoint you know there's this kind of no-till there's that kind of no-till there's you know rotations there's the perennial uh, con uh perennial uh, crops that are being coming along there's all sorts of things and i think um so i think we do need to do what you suggested and like not wait till we know exactly what the consequences are if something is it seems really good but i think we still need to learn more about it so we can be more targeted there's a question online oh. can, can 
Would you be able to read or should I read it for you? Sure. If it says if you had to choose one area of technology to invest in to help mitigate emissions, what would it be? I'm going to actually slightly answer a slightly different question than technology. I've had this idea for a long term that a really good way to actually reduce emissions um, in probably most of the, the developed world that we don't do um, would be to have government or corporations pay for insulating and making more energy efficient homes of people who can't afford to do it on their own. Um, because that's a, it's kind of in a weird way, like thinking about a degraded ecosystem in the sense that it's not going to happen on its own. Um, you, those people will save money in the future because of that. Um, and you're going to use less energy. And um, so right away, that's a case where you literally, society spends less money in the future because we know there's paybacks of insulating, putting better windows or insulating your house um, and you're using using less energy. Um, and that it doesn't happen because there's barriers to making that happen, but it's a, a case where you're, as a society, you're both saving energy and saving money. Someone has to pay the cost up front and I would argue that that's the role of, of government. I mean, we subsidize, um, we pay for many things that, that actually have economic costs, schools, hospitals, roads, um, insulating people's homes who couldn't otherwise do it. You can think of it the same way. You're providing services and that that's one example. And that's an example I give because it's one that literally, I, I'm surprised some nonprofit hasn't done this, it's literally a way that would immediately have positive benefits in multiple dimensions. Um, in terms of the, the technology part, um, there's so many technologies and, you know, I don't know which one of them is going to, I don't think, I'm not one of these people who thinks technology is going to solve this problem by itself, but technology or many, many kinds of technology can help. Like, making a, a low carbon concrete, which again, just like you can scrub CO2 out of the air, there are low uh, carbon concretes, but they need to make them more economically viable and lower carbon emissions than than they are today to become, replace the existing cement and concrete. One more, I think it's gonna be the last question. Yeah. Hi, thank you, uh, Professor Rich. I have been uh, enjoying your speech very much. Um, and what I'm going to say is rather not a question, but some of my thoughts. And I think uh, you made a point that I agree very much to. That is, um, the human being probably can coordinate to do something about the climate change, but that would need to be when the things becoming very bad. So I agree to that point very much. And I think take for, for example, take COVID-19 COVID for an example. So when uh, in China, when in Wuhan city, when there was 5,000 people died from the COVID-19, the world is, was saying that, oh, China is going to collapse. But you know what, China did not collapse. Uh, because of the COVID-19, because of 5,000 pe people's deaths, which was tragic, but not enough to drive China to collapse. And one year after, one year after, when there was 1 million people died in the United States, the Chinese people, Chinese journalists, and they say, oh, United States is going to collapse. But that did not happen either. Instead, United States opening up um, and released all the COVID restriction practices. And then we come to uh, earlier this year when China finally decided to open up and embrace up a huge peak of COVID-19 cases, which resulted uh, from at least, I think, at least 1 million people's deaths. But that did not, did not make China collapse either. So I think the problem why all the country now 
opening up for COVID-19 is because of the economic cost is too much, especially for the rich people. They don't want their business, they don't want to sacrifice their business to save people's life. Yeah. And, and of course, um, I think for climate change and mitigation, I think there is the same things, same things happening here. I think what we are going, what, what we need to do is not only to make the cost uh, little enough for the climate change to be able to be mitigated. Um, I think it actually need to make the mitigation process itself as profitable. So more people uh, will be willing to invest, invest, invest in it and to make actual change to the situation. Uh, for example, the solar panel industry and the EV cars industry, they are profitable. So people are willing to invest in it and that can actually release, relieve the problem. Yeah, so I think- Yes, that's um, awesome. lots of interesting thoughts there. And um, actually I agree with, especially the part you just said there at the end that and it already is the case that like solar and wind in much of the US at least, are more profitable, not just than coal, but than gas. Um, and because the fossil fuel industry had been getting uh, subsidies, basically, the, because the policy regulation of energy, like every part of the economy is so complicated, but then when they make it more and more plain, uh, a level playing field, you actually make more money with renewables than you do with, with even gas in a place like, maybe not Alberta, but in, in many other parts of the world. Um, and so I, I think societies can, we may be more resilient than we think or worry that we aren't, but my worry is that, you know, climate change will make COVID look like, you know, mild indigestion in terms of the numbers of people who are going to suffer. And the bigger problem is that COVID happened right now and you can try to address it right now. So the, as, as everyone in this room knows, the big problem with climate change is that is that the impacts are worse and worse in the future, but that if we wait to fix them until they're worse and worse, it's harder and harder to do. And that's like the thing we're most unable to do as human societies is that kind of problem. Um, but I do think that we will, this is, this is completely subjective. This is not like a scientific, you know, conclusion. I, I think that as things get worse and worse, the global community will realize that there's so little to gain from not stopping it and so much to gain from stopping it that all the disparate countries of the world and the disparate sectors and society will will make the changes that we have to make in policy and in attitudes and in, in our economies that, that we do slow it down and even eventually stop it. Um, you know, not in my lifetime, but um, but hopefully in some of your lifetimes. So, sure. Well, great. It's been over an, an hour and a half. So I'm going to be officially closing this seminar. I would like to thank Peter for taking the time to come to Alberta to visit with us. Uh, for that, I would also like to thank the University of Alberta's Distinguished Visitors Fund for supporting this. Uh, that allows us to bring Peter to the University of Alberta. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for staying with us until the end of this. Thank you. Okay, so join me again to thank Peter for this very interesting seminar.